Aubrey, the uh, modifications you proposed to, to do to the, to the mitochondrial genes and sticking them in the nucleus, it's given the size of the mitochondrial genome and the, and the cost of DNA synthesis right now is running around 50 or 60 cents a base. It sounds like you could do those changes and have the genes available off the shelf for something in the neighborhood of $7,000. And that's not a lot of money. And so the question is, why hasn't somebody done it? Right, and really that was the question I tried to answer in my talk. The cost is absolutely not an issue. In fact, all of those genes are available already. You don't even have to worry about variation between, individual, between human individuals because the variation in the mitochondrial DNA is, a, is so tiny. Um, but uh, the fact is that at the moment, we know how to do the modifications that cause the correct protein to be synthesized in the cytosol, even though it's being synthesized by, the, by different machinery. We also know what to do, it's very simple, to make sure that the protein is targeted to the mitochondria. But we've only very recently, just now, discovered how to target the messenger RNA to the outside of the mitochondria and so as to enable this trick called co-translational import. And really, at this point, I think it really is just a production line. I think that um, there's no obvious barriers. The, the, the only problem that we have at the moment is, if you like, sociological. The couple of years that's gone by since this discovery was made by this one group in Paris has followed a period of 20 years of disillusionment, or at least 15 years, and that disillusionment is very entrenched. So, a lot of the, so most of the people who really are equipped to work in this area are not yet persuaded. They're still being very skeptical and cynical, especially since the Paris group is not a, you know, a really major, you know, someone with a grandee running it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be not long now. Also, they've had a few other non-technical problems. The lab above them burnt down and they had to, be, they had to move out of their building, which wasn't very helpful. Um, um, so, yeah, there's been a lot of, a lot of yes, random technical things that do happen in science, but I, I, I'm very happy about how this is all going, and the moment we get any more money, we're going to be resuming funding that group the way we were a year, or two, year and two years ago, um, so that they move faster than they currently are. Questions? Greg. Aubrey, how do you explain the uh, Pepsi K must mouse? The, the, that, that mouse is one of, getting on for a dozen now, mouse genetic models that extend the lifespan of my, uh, 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 the mouse lifespan, both mean lifespan and maximum one, by altering its metabolism in one way or another. And I think that the Pepsi K mouse is, just, as, just like all the others, ultimately a genetic emulation of a large component of calorie restriction. Essentially, what happens in calorie restriction is that nutrients are lower and the, the, the mouse senses that and a variety of different, well, there are a couple of major, if you like, master control genes that cause the, um, the whole of metabolism to change and cause priorities to be altered. I um, have to apologize to Steve Spindler because I wasn't here for his talk this morning. I was being interviewed by Australian television, but um, uh, the... Um, the essence is that there's an awful lot that goes on in calorie restriction, but it's all orchestrated by pathways that sort of fan out through the whole of metabolism. Therefore, it ought to be possible to make genetic changes that emulate that, that essentially trick the mice into thinking they're on calorie restriction when they're not. And I think the Pepsi K mouse is a fine example of that. I think the ribosomal 6S6 kinase mouse that was published recently from a British group is another one. Uh, certainly the Snell and Ames dwarf mice that were discovered a long time ago, spontaneous mutations that have the same sort of effect, all seem to be the same deal. They're all segmental um, CR mimetics, uh, you know, to use the same word that George Martin coined for progerias. They don't totally um, recapitulate calorie restriction, but the types of metabolic change that we see are very similar in a lot of ways, and so I believe that that's the mechanism of action. Could you clarify that a little bit? Because um, obviously the mouse is super energetic. Mm -hmm. It's burning calories like there's no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's using its mitochondria multiples of the normal time, you know, uh, yeah. you know, how is that CR like? And it's eating more as well, actually, uh, yeah. And it's not the only one. I think there are at least, at least two other models which have the same sort of paradoxical situation. They actually eat more than normal mice, but they are thinner. So what this seems to be showing is that in some way or another, the energy isn't getting out to metabolism. The things that are sensing the amount of energy there is, things like the NAD, H and plus ratio in various compartments, the, um, and, and such like, those things are not getting the signals that they would normally get from nutrients because the mitochondria, or, in, or not necessarily the mitochondria, and sometimes it's other aspects of metabolism, are just not 
um, doing the right thing. They're not, they're not, if you like, transmitting the nutrients. The nutrients are essentially being burnt. Aubrey, I'd like your comments, um, if you have any data validation or the converse, on some of the simpler, older methods of detoxing, such as sauna, mm -hmm. uh, exercise, fasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that we can certainly say that it will be a long time uh, before those methods of extending life and postponing age-related ill health cease, uh, cease to be relevant. I think at this point, we definitely, it's still definitely true that we should be doing all we can um, to uh, live a healthy life if we want to live a long, healthy life. Um, I guess... I like to focus on these longer term things largely because so few other people are yet doing so. But that absolutely does not mean that I disagree with the importance of such things, or indeed the importance of, to go back to Greg's question, pharmacological ways of tricking the body into thinking it's on calorie restriction. I don't think calorie restriction itself, let alone memetics of it, are going to have nearly such a strong effect in humans as they have in short-lived mammals like mice. But I do think that it, they might have some effect, and it's certainly worth a try. Um, and these will be, as in, in, to, to use Ray Kurzweil's um, terminology, potentially a bridge to allow more people to live long enough, healthily enough, to benefit from the sorts of technologies that I'm interested in. Thank you.